and tell you a little bit about Ivan. Met Ivan a couple years ago up in the Pacific Northwest. We were both working on a Lindblad expedition ship in, on the Colorado River and took pretty much an immediate liking to each other due to our uh, passion for natural history. Ivan's got a strong interest in birds and he'll tell you a little bit about his company that he's been trying to get me to uh, be part of for probably three years now and um, our schedules just haven't aligned and, and this year obviously is, is a little bit funky. So we're still working on that. But with that, I am gonna pass it over to Ivan and uh, as people roll in, they can just kind of join us and we'll, we'll go from there. So whenever you're ready, Ivan, you can, you can take it and uh, share the screen. If you have issues, just let me know. All right, great. Uh, can you hear me, David? Yeah, you're all good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. This is uh, really fun to do. Um, it really is, was nice to put this together and kind of go through uh, my memories of Iceland. I'm actually supposed to be there now. Uh, I was supposed to be in Iceland leading a tour right around this time, but of course that got canceled. Um, but I have another one scheduled for next summer, so hopefully things will be back to some some version of normal next year and. I get to go back and it sounds like some of you have been so hopefully this will be fun for you as well. Uh, let me go ahead and get my screen going here. All right. Can we see that? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, you're good. Sounds good. Let me just uh, Okay. Trying to see how I can. Ivan, sit, just sit tight one minute. Some of you that are, are looking, you probably see a picture of I, Ivan in the right side and a picture of Iceland. If you go to the bar to the like left side of his, his right ear, you'll see like two little lines. You can drag those lines over to the right and make the Iceland image a little bit bigger. You can't totally get rid of the speaker, but you can get almost full screen. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Okay, yeah, so, um, what I'm going to be showing you is, uh, or most of what I'm showing you are my own photos. And this is from two different trips that I took to Iceland. And this is where I was actually uh, leading birding slash natural history tours. So in 20, uh, 2018 and 2019. Let's see if this will go forward. Okay. So anyway, there, there's me in Iceland. Um, so yeah, as, as DJ said, um, you know, I'm a naturalist. I uh, have a long passion for nature. I ended up going to grad school, uh, what seems like many years ago now. I, I got a master's in biology and ultimately a PhD in zoology. And I got that here in Oregon, which is where I live. I live outside of Portland, Oregon. And um, so I, I did population genetics. I studied frogs and aquatic insects. I did not study birds, but that is actually now my number one sort of focus in natural history is birding and bird watching. Um, but that said, like DJ, I'm interested in many different aspects of nature from, you know, the reptiles and amphibians that I loved as a kid to plants, to geology, you know, any kind of wildlife. So it's, it's all good. And Iceland has a lot of really neat things to see in regard to all that. So it's really a really great place for natural history. Uh, as DJ mentioned, I do have a, a nature tour business now called Wild Latitudes. And that's, you know, it's of course an interesting time to be owning a business like that, but um, you know, it's been going really well. I have a business partner, Steve, we lead trips all around the world and uh, Iceland is one of my kind of favorite go-to places now. So hopefully we'll be heading back there next summer. I'm gonna close my blinds a little bit. It's getting a little sunny. Uh, yeah, so you, you might've heard that uh, people in Iceland are, are attractive, at least the women are attractive, but uh, you know, there, there are some people that look a little bit like this, but this is actually not a real person. This is just a, a statue on the side of the road in Reykjavik. It's a troll, it's supposed to be a troll. Uh, you'll hear that Icelanders believe in trolls and that they believe in fairies, and maybe some of them do. I think it's a little bit more of just a fun kind of uh, tourism marketing thing, but, um, but you see this kind of stuff around, a little kind of whimsical things, which is kind of fun. So that's, that's on the streets of Reykjavik. Here's the group I took with me in uh, 2018, a bunch of good folks, and then in 2019. And those two years actually were, were interesting um, with regards to the weather. In 2018, we arrived in late June, so right around the, the solstice. So the days were insanely long. But 
that June had been one of the wettest on record. So it had been really wet and gloomy and the Icelanders were complaining. They were really bummed out because, you know, they had those long days, but the weather wasn't that nice. And, you know, they really value sunny days there in Iceland. In 2019, it was kind of the opposite. We arrived and there had been a long, dry, hot spell. So the plants and, and the plants were parched and the streams were running low and the rivers. So that was kind of an interesting contrast. <clears throat> okay, so just, just very briefly, um, some, some information about Iceland in general. So obviously it's an, an island. Um, it is located pretty far north. It sits between about 63 and 66 degrees north, not quite to the Arctic Circle. There is one little island called Grimsey, which is above the Arctic Circle. And you can fly there or take a boat, I guess, but um, I have not been there. That's the only part above the Arctic Circle. But yeah, it's, it's very isolated, as you can see. It's in the North Atlantic, and uh, it has a long history of isolation, and that really bears out in the, the plants and the animals and birds that you see there. So zooming in a little bit, um, the, the geologic history, and I'll show you a little, a little figure here in a moment about that, but Iceland, you'll often hear um, said that it's about 15 to 20 million years old, that, that the rocks of Iceland are roughly that old. Uh, and that's more or less true, but the, the volcanic activity there has been going on for much longer. There has been land that has risen up and then subsumed back into the ocean, kind of like the Hawaiian Islands. Um, so there's a, there's a much longer history, but relatively speaking, this is a, a young chunk of real estate on the surface of the earth. And it's never been attached to any other landmass. It's an oceanic island, again, that really, um, that really plays into how isolated it is, that it's an oceanic island. 10% of the land area today is covered with lava that erupted in only the last 10,000 years. So, you know, that sounds like a long time, but geologically that's very recent. So a lot of the lava that you encounter is very young and it's very sharp and jagged and hasn't been eroded because there hasn't been that much time. 10,000 years is not that much time. Um, the other thing is that the, the surface does have a fair amount of ice, as you can see there. Um, it's only about 10% uh, covered by glaciers. There are four major glaciers, and those are, of course, shrinking, so that 10% is getting, getting smaller. But, you know, Iceland is not as icy as Greenland. You may have heard that, the old story of how, you know, the, the Viking settlers named Iceland the way they did to discourage other people from coming there and then they named Greenland to encourage people to, to settle there. Um, Iceland has a pretty mild climate for where it is, for being as far north as it is, and the reason why is because it's surrounded by the ocean. It has a maritime climate. So in Reykjavik in the winter, it, the average temperature is 32, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, so it doesn't even snow there a whole lot. Now, of course, up in the mountains and those highlands it does, and you get the glaciers, but um, it's relatively mild in, in that regard, but it's also relatively cool in the summer. So a little geological figure, um, just showing that the, the kind of key element of Iceland's geology is that it sits on the mid-Atlantic ridge where the seafloor is spreading to the, the east towards Europe and to the west towards North America. So it's basically sitting on the, the juncture between those two continents, which is pretty amazing. And you have these, um, these fissures where new rock is being added to the surface of the earth along that ridge, and the land is moving to the east on the, the east side and to the west on the west side, very slowly, roughly at the rate that your fingernail grows. So that's, that's an exciting part of Iceland's geology. And there are a number of these volcanic zones that you see associated with that mid-Atlantic rift. So these volcanic zones have volcanic peaks, and they have um, all kinds of different volcanic um, features associated with them. And these are all pretty active, relatively active. Now, um, in case you're getting excited that I'm going to show, you know, pictures of me and my tour group standing next to an erupting volcano with, uh, volcano with lava pouring out, I've never seen that yet in Iceland. So you have to really be in the right place at the right time. And I believe most of that activity is, is in kind of remote areas that are tough to get to. So um, 
if that's something you expect to see when you visit Iceland, you might want to kind of recalibrate that expectation. You'll see lots of interesting geological stuff, but not necessarily flowing lava unless you get lucky that when there's a, an eruption or something. So, um, yeah, and, and the, the other thing I wanted to mention about the, the general um, ecology is the, is the plants um, of Iceland. So Iceland is mostly treeless now. Uh, it probably never had many trees, but the, the early Viking settlers cut them down pretty fast to, to build and to burn. And so um, that's one thing that's it's kind of amazing about Iceland is that you see so few trees, at least uh, you know, native trees. And what vegetation there is is really interesting, uh, but it's very small and very kind of diminutive and subtle. It's mostly kind of boreal or uh, subpolar, again, you know, or subarctic in, in nature. So mostly in the north, as you might expect, you get more of that subarctic vegetation. Um, backing up a little bit. And, you know, just briefly, the um, Iceland was settled in the late 800s, just, you know, for your kind of historical reference, by people from Norway. They were what we call Vikings. Uh, they settled in the late 800s, and they've been there continuously. Today, there are about 365,000 people, most of whom live in the biggest city, which is Reykjavik, and you've probably heard that. The economy is very much focused on tourism. That's the number one sector of the economy, followed by manufacturing. They, they manufacture a lot of aluminum there because they have cheap and renewable um, or uh, you know, cheap uh, hydroelectric power primarily, but also geothermal power. So that's a big, big deal for them. And then they also have pretty significant fisheries. But uh, what, what we go there for primarily are the natural wonders of Iceland. The culture, cultural stuff is really interesting and we, we do what we can to learn about Iceland's culture, but um, we were running around looking for, for wildlife. And when I say wildlife in Iceland, primarily what I'm talking about are birds because uh, Iceland doesn't really have much in the way of land mammals. And maybe we'll come back to that in a little bit, but um, Birds are the main feature. And I was in New Zealand recently traveling there, and maybe some of you have been there. Um, you know, they, they didn't have any native land mammals other than bats before humans arrived. So when you go to New Zealand, it's all about the birds. You see, you know, every gift shop is featuring kiwis and all this stuff. Iceland is kind of the same way. It's, it's an isolated island. It didn't have many opportunities for mammals to get there. So the birds are the number one feature. So you see, these uh, interesting signs all over the place telling you about what birds to expect in the local areas, which is just really, really fun. It's even on their currency. So uh, this is a 10,000 Icelandic kroner bill, and that's a golden plover and a golden plover chick there on the, the bill, which is pretty cool. Kind of makes me wish we had uh, more wildlife on our currency. So just a few birds that are, that are common, just kind of just getting our gears going here with the birds. Uh, this is a common red shank, a type of shorebird or type of um, sandpiper. These guys are everywhere. They're very loud, very vocal. Um, and one recurring theme when you go to Iceland, if you go there in midsummer, is that the birds are calling and singing around you all the time, pretty much 24 hours a day, because you're so far north that it really doesn't get dark completely. And the birds are just totally active. So this would be the same in you know, northern Alaska or you know, Sweden or something. But uh, it's, it's, I think, kind of one of the really cool things. These birds are active all the time. Another common bird that you see a lot is the beautiful Arctic tern. And of course, this bird is you know, the, the champion migrator you know, flying 20,000 miles or more every year between the north, you know, between the Arctic and the Antarctic. So these guys are, are nesting in the fields and the grass, and they're very protective of their nests, and they're, they're, they fly at you and attack, and <laughs> it's kind of kind of funny. Um, Eurasian oyster catchers uh, all over the place, and and these birds are they're um, they're they're fairly what we'd say confiding because for whatever reason that most of the time they're not that afraid of people. And so they're just on the side of the road, they're on fence posts, and they're just walking around practically under your feet. So even though there's not a high diversity of birds in Iceland, there's a lot of them and they're, they're really easy to observe. And I should say that uh, in terms of diversity, about 350, 370 species have been recorded in Iceland, birds. Um, 
but only maybe 70 or so or 70 or 80 are regular breeding birds there. So it, it's not really high in diversity, but again, sometimes the numbers are really impressive and also just the experiences that you can have. This is a red wing and maybe you can, you can probably guess what family this bird is in. It looks kind of like a, a, an American robin and that's because it is in that same family, the thrush family. So this is kind of uh, Iceland's version uh, of the robin. It's a very common bird all over the place. You get to know its sound pretty quickly. Now, this is one of the photos that's not mine. Almost all of these photos are mine. This one is not. I wish it was. Uh, that would be great, but this is not. Um, this is a deer falcon. A deer falcon is the largest member of the falcon family, and it's, it's the national bird of Iceland. It's uh, uh, one of the top predators, if not the top predator of the, of the island. And uh, we have seen them, and I'll show you my very bad picture of one in a little while, but um, in any case, it, it's a really special bird to see in Iceland. This is also not my photo. This is a red-necked phalarope. So another little shorebird, um, really charming birds. You see these a lot. I'll show you a few of my photos too. Um, one really interesting thing about foul ropes, if you haven't heard, is that um, there's kind of a reverse sexual dimorphism where rather than the male being the most col colorful of the sexes, it's the female. So this is a female redneck foul rope, and she mates with multiple males. The males um, tend to the eggs and the chicks, and the females basically you know, play the role we would normally think of males having. So that's kind of neat. The males aren't quite as colorful. Okay, so that was just a little intro. So now what I'd like to do is, is kind of run you through the itinerary that I've done twice now and we'll do some version of in the future and look forward to, um, you know, so we can kind of go on a little virtual tour together here. So pretty much everyone is going to start their adventure in Iceland in Reykjavik, which is on the, the lower um, or the, the southwest coast. Uh, the airport is about a 40 minute drive. It's not actually in the city. But, um, you know, you get there, it's kind of a small airport. Iceland has grown so much and the tourism has grown so much in the last decade that, you know, a lot of the infrastructure is just now catching up. And then of course, now we have coronavirus, so maybe there's going to be a, a setback again. But, um, you know, the international airport is not that impressive given how many people go to Iceland. But anyway, um, you start in Reykjavik, which is a, a really great little city. And I want to show a few pictures of that. Um, if you catch it on a beautiful summer day, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the, the temperatures can be great. It's a pretty small city, so it's easy to walk around. There are lots of museums, lots of nice restaurants, cafes. It's a really, uh, a really lovely city. And so just a few uh, street scenes here from Reykjavik. I was a little surprised when I first went to Iceland, especially outside of Reykjavik, the architecture of the smaller communities and farms is really, in my opinion, kind of lackluster. It's um, very no-nonsense, just kind of utilitarian, um, not particularly charming. Um, again, Reykjavik is, is a little different than that, but uh, yeah, so that's just one thing, you know, to kind of, to, um, to expect maybe when you go, is that, you know, the, the countryside, the buildings are kind of, kind of stark. Now, um, you might have heard that there are puffins in Iceland. Uh, there are, and we'll get to them. Um, but if you want a puffin anything, then you can do that in Reykjavik. Or basically, any gift shop is going to be overflowing with puffin, whatever, you know, <laughs> paraphernalia, uh, kind of ridiculous stuff. But um, one thing regarding puffins, and I, I'll, I should cover this later, but I might as well say now, in Reykjavik and some of the other larger communities, you can go to a restaurant and you can see sometimes on the menu puffin and whale of various kinds. Um, you know, this coming from an environmental perspective, um, you know, someone who cares about wildlife, if that's you, then you might want to not uh, do that because that is promoting the, the hunting of those animals that really is being perpetuated by tourists. The Icelandic, the Icelandic people have not uh, been eating whales and puffins as much as they used to but that industry is being kept going by, um, by tourists. So anyway, that's just, just me on my, my soapbox. Now, uh, I do not speak Icelandic. I do my very best to uh, do a reasonable job of pronouncing Icelandic words. I've actually spent a fair amount of time working on that, uh, but I am no means 
you know, exceptional at it. Um, but if there's one word that I would learn if I, you know, was going there for the first time, if, was, if there was one word, it would be coffee because I love coffee and I got to have it and I will be very unhappy if I don't have it. So, so luckily it's uh, basically phonetically the exact same thing. Please give me a coffee. Okay. So we're going to leave Reykjavik now. Um, you know, on our tour, we spent a couple nights there. Um, what we did was we spent that first night and then we went out and back to the golden circle. And I'll show you a map of that in a moment. You've probably heard of that. It's one of those things like if you only have two days in, in Iceland or one day, you got to do the golden circle. Yes, it's touristy, but it really is quite an amazing thing to do. So you see that uh, word there to the uh, right of Reykjavik, which is Thingvellur. Thingvellur, it, it's, um, it looks like Thingvellur, which is, that's okay if you want to say that. It's like, you know, if you don't want to say quesadilla, you say quesadilla, right? So we're Americans, that's how we do it. But Thingvellur is how they say it. Every Icelandic word, you, you emphasize the first syllable. Every Icelandic word, as far as I know, you, you accent the first syllable. Kind of fun. Okay, so we're going to, to the golden circle, which looks like this. There's Reykjavik on the left. And what we do is we just kind of go out and back on the top end of that loop. You see those three red markers. Those are the three main things to see on the golden circle. Uh, and I'm sure the rest of it is great too, but uh, that would make for a really long day. It's already a long day as it is. So we're gonna go to that first red dot, which is Thingvellur National Park. So the general area around Thingvellur is um, all very geologically interesting. It's sitting right on that mid-Atlantic ridge. I mean, it's, it's a pretty broad area that you can say is the ridge, but that lake there, Thingvallabotn, is sitting right in that, that suture zone or that rupture zone. And um, you can see that there is a general trend to the topography kind of in a diagonal uh, fashion from the lower left to the upper right, uh, the steep angle. Well, that, that's following those fissures in the ground that the, that the ground is cracking and expanding as new rock is being added to the surface. So that, that's what you're looking at there. Now we're gonna zoom in a little bit this is to the, the, uh, the northwest corner of that lake. And you see these little rivers and things. There are those lines and those, those are these fissures. I'm, I'm gonna zoom in even more so you can see what it's like to stand next to them. But you might've heard, this is where people say, you know, you could, this is where you can stand on one of these fissures and have one foot in, in Europe and one foot in North America. You know, it's not quite as simple as that. That would be really cool because it's a much bigger area than that. But, you know, you can take the picture and, and tell your friends that you did that if, that, if that makes you happy. So zooming in now. So this is what one of these fissures looks like up close. There's, it's, you know, covered with vegetation, but this is basalt. This is, you know, again, that relatively recently erupted lava. And, you know, you're, I'm, we're looking down one of these, these fissures, these cracks in the ground. There are quite a few, some are very deep. And besides being a really interesting place geologically, Thingvellur is the site of the original um, Icelandic parliament, the Althing, that met in the late, 18, late 800s, not 1800s, 800s, not long after Iceland was founded. So, you know, this parliamentary body, this, this gathering has, has been fairly consistent for over a thousand years, and I believe it's the oldest sort of legislative body in the world in that regard. So, so this site is where they would meet. People from all around Iceland would travel and spend a couple weeks and trade stories and um, there were merchants and there were laws that were decreed and punishments that were doled out in this spot. So there's a lot of, a lot of really interesting history here. And that's the Icelandic flag there if you, if you hadn't guessed on the right. So again, I mentioned it's touristy. It can get pretty crowded in this place because everybody goes there. Uh, there's paved paths going down through some of the larger of the fissures. Um, but it's, again, if you have the right attitude, it's really a, a fun thing to do. And there are a lot of interesting birds and plants and, you know, just a lot of cool stuff to see. So definitely don't skip this if you go. Here's one of the more beautiful fissures. This one is actually filled with water and the water is really clear. It's hard to tell from this picture. And there's actually snorkeling and scuba diving that you can do in some of these fissures um, as, a, as a paid activity. And it's, it's kind of a crazy thing. I haven't done it, but I think it would be really cool. Um, you may have heard of the different kinds of, of lava. If you've ever been to Hawaii, the Volcanoes National Park, for example, 
you know, there's that kind of jumbly piles of lava that we often call ah ah. Um, this is that ropey kind of lava. And these are these are Hawaiian words, right? Ah ah is that more cobbly, bouldery kind of stuff. And then this ropey stuff is pahoe hoe. Um, I'm not sure what the Icelandic word is, if they have one, but you know, it looks like ropes. And this was a very fast flowing, runny lava that you know, the, the surface cooled and rippled up as it, as it was cooling. Here's more of that kind of ah, uh, that kind of rough uh, lava. And one of the neat things about seeing this stuff in, in Iceland is it's often covered in moss and other kinds of vegetation. These mosses are called fringe mosses and they can make these just beautiful carpets of moss, um, just rounded and soft looking, covering the lava. So we're zooming in a little bit here. Again, this is called fringe moss. And here's you know, the specific, one of the species is you know, the most common one, woolly fringe moss. And you can see my hand sinking down into that moss. And you know, there's really hard rock underneath, but in some places you can just lay down on the moss and it's very, very comfortable. But of course it's fragile. So, you know, there are places where, you know, you have to be mindful not to, to step on the moss because tourists have of course destroyed a lot of it in some places. One of the more common flowers that you see across Iceland is a type of geranium. That's wood crane's bill. It tends to be in kind of shadier places um, underneath trees and things, but this is a, you know, a pretty large flower, big plant, really, really uh, picturesque and beautiful. A lot of nice flowers in Iceland. So this is one of the interesting birds that I've seen a couple times right there at Thingvitlur in, in the little rivers. This is a red-throated loon. In Europe, they call them red-throated divers. Loons are called divers there, which is also a good name, maybe a better name. Um, but they're nesting in this area. So that's the thing too, is a lot of these birds, these kind of arctic or subarctic or boreal birds are nesting and breeding. And so even if they're birds you might be familiar with in some other place in the world where you live or something, you may not get to see them so closely and, and to see this kind of behavior or see them in this kind of plumage. Here again is that red wing, another, you know, again, common guy, kind of their, their version of the robin. So leaving Thingvitlur, now we're gonna travel further to the east and we're gonna go to the next stop on the golden circle, which is Geyser. So it looks like Geyser, right? Well, it's not a coincidence, that's because this place is where geysers got their name. This is the original geyser. This one particular um, e eruption has that name, geyser. And um, I don't have a great photo of it actually erupting. I do have this, which is a bunch of people waiting for it to erupt. It erupts every five minutes or so. Uh, I have not been to Yellowstone myself. Uh, people tell me, of course, Yellowstone is amazing, old faithful. So, you know, if you're expecting this to be the most amazing thing you've ever seen in the world, it probably isn't. But I think it's really cool to know that this is, this is the, the namesake for all of the world's geysers. So that's pretty cool. And there's a big, uh, you know, restaurant and gift shop across the street. So sometimes behind the photos, there's a lot of activity that you're not seeing. That's kind of typical travel photography, of course. So moving further along, getting, you know, we get back in our vans, we drive a little further. This is Gullfoss. This is one of the more massive uh, waterfalls in Iceland. Foss means waterfall, so a lot of the, the names have that in there, Foss. And um, this one is really spectacular. It has this multi-tiered structure flowing over these layers of basalt. And, you know, these, this, this water is very muddy and silty, and this is outpouring from the massive glacial ice caps that, that uh, are further to the north from this location. You see there are quite a few people, definitely a busy spot, pretty wet, but quite beautiful. So that's a, that's a day trip. The Golden Circle is a day trip. There's lots of little things you know, along the way, beautiful scenery, um, definitely worth doing. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna head to the west. We're gonna you know, take a few hour drive to that peninsula sticking out, um, that skinny one there on the, on the far left. That's called the Sniflesness Peninsula. And let's see here, I'll show you a picture. There's, there it is. This is, uh, this makes another great place to go if you only have a short time in Iceland, if you only have maybe a few days, because it's often said that the Sniflesness Peninsula is like a microcosm of Iceland. It's got an ice cap, it's got 
you know, amazing geological features. It's got lots of birds, beautiful scenery. Um, you know, you can do all the things basically on this peninsula. And it doesn't have much in the way of cities. There's some, you know, some small towns, but um, that's true of most of Iceland. It's mostly pretty empty, except for small farms. But this is a beautiful place. And so I just want to show a few things from this peninsula. Um, you know, we just spend kind of a day driving around. This is Kirkjufjöll. Kirkjufjöll, and th this is the name of this mountain. And it is often called the, the most photographed mountain in Iceland. You know, it's right off the side of the road. It's got an interesting kind of cone shape. And, you know, my, my photos don't really look as nice as some of the ones you'll see if you look online, because there is a small waterfall that you can get in the foreground. So it's great landscape photography, but uh, it, it is really neat. There are a lot of tourists standing in the background that you can't see, but uh, it's neat. It's worth, worth seeing. I think it's interesting though, because the, the way you see it in almost every picture online is, is the top photo that kind of cone shape. On the bottom, it's the same mountain, just from, from a different angle. It's just a 90 degree different angle. Same mountain, Kirkjufjöll, but still quite nice. So just some uh, landscape scenery from the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, driving around. You know, for all I remember, this photo was taken probably at about 11 p.m. So, you know, giving, giving you a sense of how bright it can be at any time of the day. Um, it can be quite beautiful because you get that low light. And so for landscape photography, sometimes, you know, super early in the morning or super late at night is actually ideal. So, you know, more, more landscapes. There's some really gnarly lava fields that you can go out in that are really um, amazing, you know, covered with moss, incredible geologic landscapes. We've got some, some nice uh, columnar basalts and in this, this photo here with the waterfall, uh, here's a great example of columnar basalt, which you've probably seen at various places. Uh, you know, here in Oregon, we have a lot of it because we also have a lot of basalt. Um, these lava flows that when the lava flows are cooling, which can take decades to cool into solid rock, the lava is, is shrinking as it's cooling and it's being pulled in all directions at any given point. And so the end result is you get these hexagonal columns as the, the lava cracks as it's cooling and so that that's what happened here and then these are great places for waterfalls because you have this solid layer of basalt for the water to flow over. Uh, of course I have to mention the Icelandic horses. Uh, you see a lot of these guys around. It is a special breed unique to Iceland. They've been bred there for over a thousand years and um, they're kind of a small stocky horse sometimes called Icelandic ponies. They're really really beautiful. They have this kind of long flowing hair. Um, they, they export these horses. They're, they're a desirable breed and they're a show breed, um, I, I believe mostly. They can leave Iceland, but they can never come back. And no other horses are allowed into Iceland because they're trying to keep this, this bloodline, this, this breed pure. And so they also don't want diseases to come in. So if an Icelandic horse leaves, it never comes back, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So just a few more shots of these guys. Again, very, very great photo subjects if you're into photography. Just that long flowing hair and if it's breezy, you know, it's just, just great. And I wasn't even really trying that hard to get good photos here. These are just kind of, you know, quick photos that I was taking. A little full there. So yeah, great animals. So maybe a little less, uh, a little less photogenic would be the Icelandic sheep. And there are a lot of these guys. It's kind of like New Zealand. Again, there, there are a lot of sheep. And they're, they're mostly uh, free ranging. So when you're driving on these remote roads, you have to be very vigilant because the sheep will sometimes just wander right out into the road. Um, so you have to really kind of keep an eye on them. They're all over the place, but, but they're kind of fun. And, and it is an Icelandic breed. It's a specific breed. It's very hardy, can handle the Icelandic winters, just like the horses. Out towards the tip of the Snæfellsnes Peninsula is Londrangar which is um, a spot with some really great bird cliffs, really um, steep cliffs dropping off into the ocean. Uh, you can see a few birds flying around there in the bottom of the image. You know, the, the cliffs are covered with various seabirds and, and we're gonna talk a bit more about those later, but I'll, I'll show you one for now, which is one of my favorites, which is the razorbill. Um, you know, of course we're getting to the puffins. I know, you know, maybe everybody's chomping at the bit to see the puffins, but um, the razorbill is not quite as, as popular 
but um, it's in that same family, the Alcidae family, the, the ox. It's a similarly kind of sized and kind of plump seabird. It spends most of the year out in the ocean, only comes to land to breed. And uh, yeah, just a really neat bird. That bill is just, is kind of spectacular. It's unique. So the Sniffles Peninsula, I, I love it. I, I wish we had more time on our tours to stay there. Uh, it's the kind of place that I just, I've explored on my own a bit. Um, but, you know, our tour is about 12 days long, so we got to keep moving. So um, now what we do is we take a ferry from that peninsula north into this bay. So this is Breidefjordr. So that's, you know, fjord is bay, right? So this is a, a huge bay that has many different islands, uh, lots of little islands in it. And so we take the ferry, we actually put our vans on the ferry, and everybody gets on there. It's a really nice, um, you know, hour and a half or so ferry ride to this little island we're heading to. And the ferry ride itself is fun because you get to see, you know, birds and things and, and it's neat. But where we're going is this island called Flate. And it looks like Flaty <laughs> or Flatty, uh, but it's Flate. And I would say Flate Island, but that would be redundant because EY means island. So saying Flate is flat island in Icelandic. So we just, it's just Flate. It's very small, as you can see, there's the scale, 3,000 feet for that little bar. And maybe you can see in the image, the little dots, the little buildings that are there. So, you know, a couple hundred years ago, this was actually a hub of human activity. There were lots of people crowding on this island. Um, today, there are only five year-round residents. There are still some buildings, some of them are a little, quite a bit, you know, are fairly old, but most of them are like summer houses. Um, they're not occupied year round, just, just in the tourist season. So you get off the ferry and we leave our vans on the ferry and the ferry takes our vans and we meet them up the next day. So we're gonna spend the night on Flate Island and meet up with our vans later. So we get off the, the ferry and you walk um, to the hotel, they take your stuff for you. And it's just, it's incredibly charming. It's, it's the highlight for many people of the trip is Flate Island. So if you're, you're thinking about Iceland, seriously consider going to this place and staying a night or two. It's very peaceful, very, very charming, a lovely little place. So here's the group uh, going for a nice little, little walk, um, you know, heading out to do some bird watching, probably after dinner. I think that's what, when we were doing this. So this is maybe, this might even be like 9.30 p.m. from what I remember. There's our hotel on the, the left, not a great um, angle on it, but it's a nice old farmhouse that was converted into a hotel. You see that a lot in Iceland, old farms that are converted into guest houses, lodges of various kinds. Um, and there's a lot of that across Iceland because again, tourism is the number one industry. There's the little restaurant inside, very charming. They make great food, just, just awesome. They have this poster inside of, um, of the birds of Iceland, and, and they explain to me what these names mean. These are the two phalaropes that are found in Iceland. On the, on the left, you have the red neck phalarope that I showed you, and on the right is the red phalarope, what they call gray phalarope in Europe, which on Flate Island, that's your best chance of seeing that bird, and I have not seen it yet. I've been dipped. I, I've not seen the red phalarope on that island, but uh, hopefully someday. But here's the, here's the cool thing. The names. Look at the names. So, Redneck fowl rope is Odin Shani, Odin Shani. And then the other one is Thor Shani. So what that means is Odin's rooster and Thor's rooster. So there you go, your, your Norse gods, they have their own roosters and there they are. They're not actually related to roosters whatsoever, but that's okay, uh, the Vikings didn't know. And there you go, there's Odin Shani himself. Uh, that is a juvenile redneck fowl rope wandering around on the, the road aimlessly just beneath our feet, looking very cute. Another bird we see quite well on flat day is the snow bunting. They're singing, they're flying from rooftop to rooftop, they're all over the place. And I should say that this is where we start to see our first puffins is on flat day. There are quite a few puffins around in the area, so that's really exciting when that happens. So a few nice shots of snow bunting. This guy's got a little band on his uh, leg, so somebody has, has been studying this bird, who knows where. And there's one uh, singing loudly, belting it out. You got a nice little song. These are all males. And then again, the common red shank. These, this is that loudly calling sandpiper that uh, will be out your window when you're trying to sleep at 1 a.m. 
singing very loudly. And then the Arctic Turn again. Uh, here's one calling. They're, they're nesting on the island. So this is where I got beamed in the head by one. It pecked me in the head pretty hard. Uh, I was laughing before that, and I was still laughing after, but my head was, was smarting pretty good. Um, at the hotel, they have a bin full of sticks that they ask you to borrow as you go out walking around. You hold the stick above your head, trying to deter the, the Arctic Turn from jabbing you in the head as it's it thinks it's defending its nests from you, this terrible predator. But uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty tough little birds. So then the next morning we leave Flate. We're very sad because we want to stay forever, but we head out, we get on the ferry, we get our vans on the mainland. And where we're heading now is to that giant kind of baseball mitt looking peninsula on the upper left, and that's called the West Fjords. The far left point of that is Lautrabjarg, Lautrabjarg, and that is the westernmost point of Iceland, often called the westernmost point of Europe. Here's a little zoomed in image of the West Fjords. This is a very remote part of Iceland, uh, relatively speaking. A lot of itineraries don't go here because it, it does take a long time to get out there. It takes a long time to get around once you are there. But to me, it's absolutely worth it. It's stunningly beautiful. It's, it's lonely, it's remote. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And you can see that it's called the West Fjords. Every one of those inlets is a fjord. It was carved by a glacier during the last ice age, those kind of long, deep inlets. And the roads dip in and out of these fjords. And so it takes forever to get anywhere, but the roads are really good, both paved and unpaved. And you come around every corner into a new fjord and it just has a different feeling. It, it, it looks different and it's beautiful in its own way. So. Um, Again, this is something that I would, would try to always have on an itinerary to Iceland, given enough time. So where we're heading now is that far left point, Lauterbjörg. Okay, so here's just a few pictures from the West Fjords, though. Again, just these beautiful landscapes, amazing waterfalls. They're everywhere in Iceland. Um, if you love waterfalls, you'll, you'll never get tired of it. We see a lot of whooper swans. I've seen some of these fjords where there are just hundreds of swans floating on the water. And then if you get there at the right time of year, you can see the little guys, the little cygnets, the baby swans. The gray lag goose is not just in the West Fjords, it's all over the place in Iceland. Uh, this is kind of their answer to the, uh, the Canada goose. Maybe not quite so common, but um, there are a lot of gray lag geese. The golden Plover, this one I showed you, that was, this was on that 10,000 kroner bill, a beautiful plover. Uh, you can see these quite easily. And again, you know, I don't have the, the, the largest telephoto lens in the world. I'm getting some decent shots of these birds because you can get quite close. So it's, in a way, it's kind of like going to the Galapagos or something where the animals are, seem to be kind of naive. I'm not sure why that is in Iceland because these birds spend often time in Europe and, and elsewhere, but it's, it's nice that you can get so close. Here are a bunch of common eiders. Um, eiders are a type of sea duck. They're, they're large. They're very beautiful. The males are beautiful. I don't have an amazing photo of one of these guys yet. I'm hoping to get one someday because they're so beautiful. Uh, eiders are famous, and you may know this already, uh, for their down. Uh, for many generations, Icelandic people have been collecting eider down uh, in a sustainable way because these, these ducks come ashore and they pluck their own down to make a nest that's soft for their eggs and their chicks. And so then the Icelanders just take those feathers from the nest eventually and it doesn't do the ducks any harm. And so there's this kind of symbiotic relationship. And it's really amazing down used for blankets and clothing and things like that. So that's, that's kind of one of the special Icelandic commodities. And it's actually, I'm not sure if this is still true, but the, the common eider was the first bird that was protected in Iceland in the late 1800s. And I think it might even be like the only bird that's, that's officially protected in Iceland. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's, it's something like that. So they really care about their eiders. Uh, another uh, a nice plant is the Arctic poppy. We, we only start to see these as we get uh, north of the Snæfellsnes Peninsula. We get up into the West Fjords. We, we've transitioned into a true Arctic or subarctic type of flora. And so really, you can see really interesting stuff that you might see either only in high mountains or in Arctic areas around the world. A lot of these same species are found in Alaska and Northern Europe. 
elsewhere. Okay, so alas, uh, or at last we've arrived um, to what is for many people one of the most exciting animals to see in Iceland, the Atlantic puffin. Uh, these guys, most of the world's population of Icelandic puffins nests in Iceland, maybe about 60%. And you know, it's, it's many millions of puffins. Um, and so now this picture was taken at Lauterbjarg, which you know, in my experience is a great place to take photos of these guys because you can get very close to some extent, they might be habituated. I'm not sure if that's true, but um, but there are these really massive cliffs that are you know hundreds of feet above the the sea, and that are they're precipitous and they're just covered with seabirds. And so um, it's not just puffins; it's all kinds of other species as well. But um, if you want to see puffins, you know this is a great spot. It's not guaranteed, but it's probably the best spot you can you can go to. Again, it takes a bit of work to get out there, but uh, pretty. Pretty jazzed about seeing these guys and getting some some shots. Now I was I was probably less than ten feet away from these birds to get these kind of shots, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, here's another razor bill, again one of my favorites, great bird. And here is what it can look like when you're taking pictures of puffins. Okay, so again, lots of uh, tourists. This is mostly my group here, um, and maybe you can see on the lower left there's a puffin there. Um, and as you walk up and down this cliff, it's not all crowded like this, but um, they're just puffins all over the place. So you have a lot of opportunities and they're just hanging out and it, it's really a wonderful thing. And you are, at, again, the farthest west point of Iceland and of Europe. It's a very lonely, isolated place. You're way the heck out there. And you know, something that the, the tourist brochures don't always show you is uh, what the bathrooms are like, right? So this is the bathroom at Lauterbjarg. It's the only one for many miles. And so, uh, you know, we all all lined up and uh, used it. it. Didn't matter what was in there, we were gonna use it because that's all there was. And there really aren't trees to hide behind or bushes. So uh, a lot of times uh, people aren't too comfortable with that. So just something to think about, but you know, we never really have a problem. It's just kind of funny. Okay, so now we're gonna head to the Northeast. We're gonna, we're gonna dip in and out of those different fjords on a long windy road beautiful journey. Um, we're going to stay the night at Isafjordur, which is a small town. It's one of the larger towns in Iceland, but it's, it's still pretty small. Um, and then the next day, we're going to take a boat to Hornstrandir. And Hornstrandir is a nature reserve. It's basically kind of like a national park. And it's one of the most isolated and protected natural areas in Iceland. And it's absolutely stunning. Isafjordur, uh, however, is the town that you take your boat from. It's not a bad place. It's okay. It's got some good restaurants and stuff, but this is kind of typical Iceland in my experience. It's just, again, kind of, kind of gray, kind of not, you know, overly charming, but, uh, but clean and nice and, and, you know, pleasant enough. So we get in a boat early in the morning and depending where you're going in the reserve, Hornstrander Reserve, um, it might be an hour boat ride, it might be a two hour boat ride, or maybe a three hour boat ride. I've done it a couple different ways. The first year we did it, we went way out and we did a much larger, more epic hike. The next year uh, we did something a little more mild. And so, you know, both had their advantages, pros and cons, but um, the first time we had to go on a much, much longer boat ride. And we got to see some of these great bird cliffs. So again, these just towering cliffs covered with seabirds, you know, layer upon layer of volcanic rock basalt with waterfalls pouring off of them. Really spectacular. And when you can get close to the cliffs, you can see that they're, you know, again, covered with birds. Here, for example, we have thick-billed myrrhs, common myrrhs, uh, as well as some, uh, some kittiwakes. And uh, yeah, black leg kitty wakes. I think that's it there, but there could be puffins, other things, full Mars. There's a close up of the thick billed mirror. These are in the same family as the puffins again. You can actually see an egg, uh, the, the bird on the top. You can only see the belly of the bird, but there's an egg under. And the eggs are just, just precariously placed on these cliff edges. It's really just amazing what these birds can do. So the thick billed myrrh is, you know, is, is Kind of an exciting bird to see. It's uh, less common than the uh, than the common myrrh. <laughs> uh, Northern fulmars are pretty common in Iceland. If you were just visiting and you weren't you weren't knowledgeable about birds, you didn't care about birds, you would see these and probably just go, "Oh, it's a it's a seagull," you know. 
um, not a seagull. There's no such thing as a seagull, but it's not a gull even. It's not in that family. It's in the, um, the same family as the petrels and the shearwaters. So this is a type of tube nose. So it just superficially looks like a gull, but it is not closely related to gulls at all. There are quite a few of these dudes around. So uh, as I mentioned, the first year we did this kind of big epic hike and um, it really was amazing. It was uh, a bit much for most people. So at various points we had people turning back, going back and um, hanging out and waiting for the rest of the group. I had five people that made the, the whole loop with me um, and they had an amazing experience. But you know, for the age group of people in, in our, on our tours, you know, it was something I didn't do the second time around. I might not ever do that particular hike again even though, you know, I think it's pretty awesome. Because you get to see this, and this is, um, this is the Hornvik, or the horn, um, which means just horn, just like it sounds in English, um, this amazing razor-edged peak that drops off straight down into the ocean on one side and then has this shallow bowl-like feature on the, the other side, all carved by glaciers, absolutely stunning scenery, totally amazing. So you do this big loop hike and, and you know, everything you do is just epic. So, you know, if, if you're in reasonable fitness, if you're in reasonable shape, there's a couple steep spots, you know, really you can, you can just go slow. One gentleman here had some kind of major issues with his ankles and he did it. He had trekking poles and he did it. He probably wouldn't ever do it again, but he did. Um, again, just more views of that hike. There's kind of the steep hike on the, the, the bottom. It doesn't look as steep maybe as it is. But you can see the panorama on top. I mean, you just see you know, what you're rewarded with at the top of that climb. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So on the left is the, the Arctic Ocean, just open ocean. And on the right is, is a fjord. Uh, and again, because you're in kind of this subarctic zone, you get to see some neat plants. So here's rose root, which is in the same family as stone crop. So this is kind of a, uh, a succulent plant of the Arctic and of Alpine environments, really beautiful. So you can just kind of get down on your, your belly and check out all these beautiful flowers in this kind of area. Heath spotted orchid, there are a number of different orchids in Iceland. This is, I think, the most beautiful. There's also, uh, this one's very common. This one's kind of restricted to Iceland. Um, it's kind of a special orchid, the uh, leafy northern green orchid, not quite as showy. And one of the stars of the show of this particular location, this remote part of the Hornstrander Reserve, is the fact that the, there are Arctic foxes. Arctic foxes used to be common across Iceland, but they were persecuted and actually are still persecuted. They were hunted you know, almost to extinction everywhere else in Iceland, but because this Hornstrander Reserve is so uh, protected and isolated, the, the foxes are fairly unafraid of people and they're, they're around. We probably saw six different Arctic foxes that day. And if you're wondering why is it not white, that's because it's, this is summer. This is what they look like in summer. They kind of look like a, a malnourished cat. But in the, in the winter, they've got that beautiful puffy uh, white coat. So we don't get to see them like that. But got a few photos of these guys and they were very curious. They're very smart. Um, they're, they're kind of howling and making these funny little noises as they were checking us out, walking around. And, uh, you know, I really want to pet them. They look really soft, <laughs> but I don't think they'd let me get that close. But uh, that was just a real treat. The next time I went to Iceland, we didn't really see, like, we didn't see any Arctic foxes because we didn't go to this particular spot, which is really the best place to see them. Now, I mentioned early on, you know, that Iceland has a paucity of mammals. Now, that's not true if you're talking about marine mammals. There are quite a few different whale species, um, pinnipeds, things, you know, seals and things. But there's only one terrestrial mammal, and you're looking right at it. The only land-dwelling mammal in Iceland is the Arctic fox. And again, that's because it's so isolated. These little guys, how did they get there? As far as we know, they had to have gotten there when there was continuous ice connecting Greenland to Iceland, or at least large flows of ice that multiple foxes could ride across to get to Iceland. And that would have been a long time ago, and now they're isolated there. But really not much opportunity for other mammals. And even when you get there, it's not a very uh, great place to live. So you have to be a pretty hardy animal. And Arctic foxes are definitely very hardy. So this is the second year. This is from last summer, uh, where we went to a, a much closer place. And this place actually had this farmhouse 
that the tour company owned that we chartered and we chartered a boat and they had this nice little farmhouse that we could relax in and stay warm in if we needed to. So people had an option of like hanging out, taking a nap or going for a more vigorous hike, bird watching. It was a really lovely day to spend there. So a lot of us went on you know, uh, a walk. This was one of the kind of Indiana Jones moments for everybody, uh, for many people. It was a small bridge over a small creek, but uh, you know, for anybody with a little bit of a balance issue, it was a little scary, but I think everybody you know, was, was proud of themselves after they got across. It's quite a, a beautiful spot. There again is that farmhouse. We're out looking at some, there are some harlequin ducks in that creek, so that's what they're looking at. And yeah, that's it for Hornstein there. So now, um, you know, and I'm not showing all the hotels and all that kind of nitty gritty stuff, you know, um, but you know, we, we stay at nice places, you know, they're again, kind of, kind of basic in terms of, uh, you know, they're not fancy five-star hotels, but comfortable, clean, safe. Uh, and there's some really lovely uh, guest houses that we stay at. So, um, so suffice to say we do that. And now we have this kind of long day of driving from the West Fjords all the way to Mivaten, which is that far uh, right point. And so that's our biggest kind of travel day. It's got some cool highlights as well, but you know, it's just one of those things you got to do. Along the way, just before we get to where we're staying uh, in Mivaten is Akureyri. Akureyri is the second largest city in Iceland. So you have Reykjavik and then Akureyri, which is, uh, you know, I'm not sure how the populations compare. This one is quite a bit smaller than Reykjavik, but it's got some charm. It's a nice little town. Um, I haven't really spent much time there, but you know, it, it it's got a lot of activities. You can go whale watching from there. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's a neat town. And that's where the airport is too, I should mention. So we fly out of Akureyri. We kind of do a one-way trip. So we start in Reykjavik, fly out of Akureyri. You still have to fly through the international airport, but instead of driving back for 10 hours. So there in the lower left, you see Akureyri, that's the city. And then we continue on to that dark blob there, which is um, actually, no. That dark blob is lava. If you go a little further south of that dark blob, just to the lower left of the, um, the uh, scale bar, you see this kind of green blob. And that green blob is Lake Mivatn, which is redundant because Vatn means water or lake. So Mivatn means fly lake, fly lake. And it is one of the hot spots of bird watching in the world. It's you know kind of in those top 100 lists, certainly for Europe. And it's perhaps more exciting for people who are from Europe to go there because what they can see there are a number of species that are more North American in character, like things like Harlequin duck or um, Barrow's golden eye. There are lots of ducks there. It's incredibly um, diverse for uh, waterfowl. It's a shallow lake. It has lots of small uh, invertebrates in it. It's relatively warm, so it supports all of those, um, all of those birds. It's a fantastic place. We spend three nights there and several days, and it's just absolutely wonderful. Now I said the lake means fly lake, the name Mivaten. So yes, there are uh, at times some midges that are annoying. Some of which bite, many of which don't. Um, you know, it, in my experience, it hasn't been that bad at all. This is one moment where everybody decided to put their head nets on that we supplied. Uh, them with. Uh, but most of the time we didn't bother. Most of the time it really wasn't a big deal. That, that could just be that we've been lucky, but you know, I think, I think it's just, you can, you know, there are occasional outbreaks of these things. But that's what supports the ecosystem, right? The, the insects, their larvae, all of that is what allows there to be so many birds. So you got to look at it that way. <clears throat> So Mivaden is, is exciting for the bird watching, but it's also really exciting for the geological wonders that surround it. So, uh, you know, we do kind of one day of bird watching and then another day focused more on the geology. Um, you know, there are these really cool structures, these uh, lava structures at the edge of the lake. There are these craters, there's all kinds of wacky stuff. This is the same location, just a little better photo, I think from the second year. Um, just just a great place to check out. So if you drive a little ways away from the lake, you get to landscapes like this. There is um, the Krafla volcano. There's this volcanic field in this area. And so in this area, you can go and see a lot of you know, boiling mud pools and fumaroles. You know, it smells like sulfur. It's um, like being on another planet. It's, it's really cool. 
So again, we don't see flowing lava, but we see some of this really fascinating geological stuff. There's a pool of you know, bubbling mud. And um, this is a, a, a stunningly beautiful place near the shores of the lake called Dimmuburger. And um, it's, I mean, it's hard to explain the geology, but you, basically there was this massive lava flow that started to, to solidify, but then it drained out, leaving behind these towers, these kind of hills of lava. And there's these paved paths that go through there and the plant life and the birds. And it's just otherworldly, really spectacular. Um, we do some, some further uh, adventures away from Lake Mivatan. We go out to these kind of hinterlands where you've got just this Mars-like landscape of cracked basalt going off into the distance. I mean, it's, Iceland is so stark and it seems to be empty, but every part of it has this unique character and um, it'll just keep surprising you as you come around the next bend. It's really amazing. This is the walk to um, this giant waterfall, which I'm trying to remember, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it at the moment, but I'm going to show you a picture. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the waterfall at the moment, but it's, it's a, I think it's the largest waterfall by volume in Europe. This was a rainy day, but you can see it's just all this volcanic landscape on the way. And there's the waterfall itself. Um, it's something Foss, right? <laughs> Foss means waterfall. Um, I'm cycling through other waterfall names. It's not Gold Foss, Vodafoss, anyway. It's uh, escaping me at the moment, but definitely worth doing. Thundering, amazing. This one, I do know the name of. This is Godafoss, like God, God's waterfall. Um, really, probably one of the most beautiful. Um, this is the one we see on our way back, our last day heading to the airport in Akureyri. Um, just a, a beautiful scenery. Now, I mentioned there aren't a lot of trees in Iceland. Um, it's relatively devoid of forest. There are some places where you can see forests still. Uh, it's the Arctic birch, which is the, the dominant species. And so you can see it in some places like this. We do some nice walks through the forest. You can see some maybe different forest dwelling birds in these areas, which is really fun. Uh, for example, the Eurasian wren, we got a nice view of one singing in the forest. So, yeah, maybe Iceland will have forests again someday. You know, they're trying to restore some of the vegetation, but uh, yeah, it'll, it's going to take a while. It's more nice wildflowers, wild pansy. And I wanted to show this photo because I wanted you to just to see another <laughs> for example of uh, lodging. So, you know, we stay usually between, you know, two nights, three nights at a place. Um, they look pretty stark, you know, from the outside, kind of, again, no nonsense, but the rooms are often immaculately clean, very, very nice. Um, the food is very good. It's pretty simple. There's not a lot of options usually. It's usually like lamb, um, you know, cod, and maybe like, I don't even know, I'm a vegetarian. I, I forget <laughs> what the options are, but it's like three or four things, including vegetarian. I've never had any trouble getting vegetarian food, but, um, but what they do make is, is very good. It's well made. Anyway, just, just kind of some, something to see. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I don't have a good photo of a Jura falcon. This is my very bad photo of one. We've seen them quite a bit in this area around Lake Mivan. They love all of those ducks and other birds like the rock ptarmigan. It's perfect for them. So, um, you know, the, the Jura falcon, it's not a guarantee that you'll see them there, but they nest there. So um, it's, it's a great place to look for them. We get some nice looks usually at harlequin duck. They're breeding here on the rivers and the streams. Uh, we've had some nice looks at rock ptarmigan. This is, you know, one of those birds that those deer falcons would love to sink their talons into. And on the lower left there, you see there's a, a little chick. It's a little baby rock ptarmigan. And you can see how well this female ptarmigan is camouflaged. You know, she blends in so incredibly well. Uh, so it can be hard to see these birds sometimes unless they move. There again is Odin Shani, the Odin's rooster, the redneck phalarope. And uh, we've got a nice shot of the Arctic tern. You never get enough of those guys. Now notice the lupins behind this bird. It makes for a beautiful shot, right? And, and they are very beautiful, um, but these are non-native. These lupins are from Alaska. And they were introduced as a, a mechanism to control erosion because soil erosion is a major problem in Iceland because they've, they've gotten rid of a lot of their vegetation. 
There are sheep trampling the soil. So they brought in this lupin and of course it's spread like wildfire and perhaps it's done its job in places of stabilizing the soil, but it's of course an ecological problem. Um, but you know, most tourists just go, ooh, pretty flowers, you know, so it's a balance. You know, sometimes ignorance is bliss. <laughs> And I think we're getting toward the end here. I just wanted to show another uh, Icelandic horse. There's a nice little little uh, foal there near our lodge. So lots of lots of nice interactions with these guys. And yeah, and that's it. I, I know it was a little over an hour, so thank you for your patience. And uh, if you got some questions, I would be happy to do my best to answer them. Thank you. I just have to say what a superb presentation this was. I was in Iceland about a year ago, and we didn't see anywhere near as much flora and fauna as you display there. Do you lead your own trips? Yes, yes. This was the, uh, those were two trips that I was kind of summarizing there that uh, I lead for my company, yes. So could I ask your company name so I can check it out? I'd love to go back again. Yeah, sure. So the name of the business is Wild Latitudes. And okay. uh, we have a website, of course, wildlatitudes.com. You won't see an Iceland trip uh, promoted there right now, but we do have one um, that I'm running through an Audubon Society out of California. So if you happen to be interested, then, then uh, you can shoot me an email. I'll just give that to you guys now too. It's just my name, Ivan at wildlatitudes.com. Just the way it sounds, Ivan at wildlatitudes. And yeah, if you're curious about Iceland, I mean, if you just have any questions about going on your own, or if you are interested in going with us, with me, I would be delighted to talk to you about it. So yeah, please, please let me know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Ivan, um, I noticed you didn't do too much of the South Coast and Westman Island. That's true, yeah. You know, um, the, the itinerary that I put together there <clears throat> was trying to find, you know, the balance given only the, that we had about 12 days of birds and geology you know, and, and so we knew we had to get to Lake Mivatn, for example, we couldn't pass that up. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, I mean, if, if we did a two week trip or maybe, you know, a 16 day trip, we could probably circumnavigate and add some of those. Uh, well, those next other time we go back there, if we do, I want to do the area of the upper Northwest and the North, because that's what we missed. And those were beautiful things. They are, they're, they're stunningly beautiful. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. Hey, uh, Ivan, there's a question about the, um, a lot of the birds have orange fluorescent coloring on their beaks and their legs. Is there any um, like evolutionary advantage or reason for that that you know of? Is it a real thing or, you know? Yeah, you know, um, so for example, like with puffins and some of these shorebirds and things, I mean, you, you may have heard about, you know, blue-footed boobies, for example. Uh, some, some birds, when they have those bright colorations uh, on their skin, their legs, it can be a sign of the, the health or the fitness of the animal because oftentimes those colors come from the things they're eating. And if they're eating enough of the right thing, then they have very vibrant colors. So that could be that could make them more attractive to the opposite sex. Uh, the other thing would be, of course, that just distinct plumage and coloration just allows species to recognize each other very quickly and easily. So, you know, it's probably some combination of those things and probably varies from species to species. But, uh, you know, again, that's bluefoot boobies. You know, they show their blue feet to their, their potential mate, and that's, they're showing off, hey, look, you know, I've, I'm well fed. I'm a healthy individual. Look at my beautiful feet, you know. So it's probably something like that. Ivan, I have a question for you. Sure. How long was your epic hike that only five members of your group made it through? Well, distance wise, I think it comes in at about five miles. Um, and it, you know, it took us most of a day, maybe, maybe six hours to do or seven hours. Um, again, just because we had to go kind of at the slow pace, given a couple of individuals are relatively slow. Most of it was pretty easy walking. It's just there, there were some spots that climbed pretty steeply, almost like hands and feet, not really rocky, just kind of muddy and grassy, but um, you know, a little steep for some folks, um, but yeah. So five miles total round trip? Yeah, it was a big loop. So, I, you know, as, as I recall, it was five, maybe six tops, yeah. Uh-huh. Cool. What yeah. kind of elevation change was on that, Ivan? Oh, good question. I mean, it probably, you probably only go up 
thousand feet, something like that at most. I think it's 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 not crazy. I mean, you start at sea level, of course, but you know, right. But it's less because it's in meters, right? It's only a third of that in meters. <laughs> right. So yeah, so it's easy, you know. <laughs> you wise guy. <laughs> is it metric there? Is everything metric? Um, yes, it is. Yes. Yep. Uh, they speak English. Didn't mention that. Um, you know, the, the, the language is fun. I definitely encourage people to, to try to figure it out. Uh, but basically everywhere you go, they speak pretty good English. So it's, it's a pretty easy country to get I, around. I tuned in late. Did you get to the Blue Lagoon? No, good, good question, though. Um, you know, I, I, I meant to show a slide of another hot spring, right, a hot pool. So that she, she's mentioning the Blue Lagoon, which is the, the world famous um, communal pool uh, that's fed by hot springs, by geothermal water. Um, that's near the airport, kind of close to Reykjavik. Um, I haven't been to that one. Um, I'm sure it's really nice. Of course, really